Well, good morning, boys and girls. Um, this is Pastor Jason. Just want to say hi and good morning and um, hope you're doing well. I can't wait to, for the next time that we get to come together again. Um, we are going to start a new series today. We're going to ask the question, what did Jesus heal people from? And the answer is Jesus healed people from sickness and sin and death. Um, this is a great lesson about friends and how, as a friend, you could help people. You can help people come to Jesus. Uh, before this, we talked about why did Jesus perform miracles? And Jesus actually, in our story today, performs a miracle. And the answer is Jesus performed miracles to glorify God and prove He is God the Son. And you know what? Today they're going to learn a lot how powerful Jesus really is. Can you think right now, why don't you close your eyes and think about a friend's name. And in, in your head, you're thinking about that name. Reach up and grab it, okay? Think about that name. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to yell out the, your friend's name. Okay, you ready? One, two, oh, okay, well, hold on a second. Your parents are going to think you're a little bit crazy when you just yell out a name. That's okay. Just tell them Pastor Jason said it was okay, okay? So one, two, three. Yeah, man, you guys got lots of friends. I mean, you have lots of friends. So when I read this story in Mark chapter 2, it reminds me of friends and how powerful they can be, okay? And how Jesus has a part in this story. So you're looking for Mark, and Mark is in the New Testament. Yeah, you're right, New Testament. And it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So we're looking for the second book in the New Testament, Mark. And you're looking for the big number two, the big number two, Mark chapter two. And in, in my Bible, in Mark chapter two, there's a title, a heading that we've added in there that says, Jesus heals a paralytic. And the first question I have when I read that is, is what is a paralytic? A paralytic is a person that is paralyzed. So Jesus heals a person that's paralyzed. Wow, that it sounds like a miracle, which it is. And um, I wonder how that's going to happen. So if we start at verse number one, which in my Bible, there's not a little one there. There's just a big number two. So that's the beginning of the chapter. It says, and when he returned to, oh boy, I got to sound that one out. And I'm going to sound it out is Capernaum. Capernaum was a very, very, familiar city to to Jesus. This is where he lived when he was adult. So it says, and when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Well, Jesus was really, really popular. Um, people were talking about where he was at. They, they were all talking about it. So it says reported. That means people were talking, Jesus is at home. Let's go see. Let's go hear. And people were super curious about this man, Jesus. Um, and many were gathered, verse 2 says, together. So there was no more room. Uh, I, I'm going to add a picture for you. Check out this picture. There are people like all around this building, this house. There are actually people up on the stairs. They're peering into the windows. And this house is what it would look like in Bible times that where Jesus would live. That's This is the houses that people lived in. It, they look sort of like this. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to see a man that's on a cot, it looks like thing, or a blanket. And there's four guys carrying them. And we're going to talk about them here in a second. But it says that there was no more room. So imagine the whole room was filled up. You can think about inside that the only light that was coming in the room was a light from the outside, maybe a lamp, but it was you know, probably dark in there because they didn't have electricity back then. And so there was no more room, not even at the door. And as he was preaching the word, and he was preaching the word to them. So he was preaching the word, his words, God's words. And they came bringing to him a paralytic. Do you remember what paralytic is? You're right. Paralyzed man carried by four men. And those four men, we're going to call his friends. And I know why they're his friends, and you'll understand why they're his friends too. So four friends were carrying this paral paralyzed man, okay? And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, 
they went on the roof. And the Bible says they removed the roof. So I got a picture of the roof for you in yeah, on the screen. And back then, the roofs were a little bit different than what we're used to roofs-wise. So there were probably logs that went across the whole room. And on top of that, there was probably like hay or something, a straw or branches or something like that were smaller to help with that. Then on top of that, there was mud or we would say clay. And in the winter months, they would make that and then they would put it up and they add water and dirt and, and put it up there and they would seal the roof off, okay? Then they would have a roller that they would flatten the whole roof out, okay? And then you know what happens in the springtime when you have dirt and water and some rain, what happens? Grass grows. And a lot of times these roofs had grass on top of them. And there's even stories about how some people put their livestock on the roof, which was super interesting. But also this was an area for them to collect the water because it was flat for them to, to go down into a jug or something uh, as drinking water because they um, relied on that. There was no like running water as much as like we have today. So you think about this flat roof, but in this time was probably around a time where the roof was dry, I would assume, that it was dry. I don't know that for sure, but in the pictures and what I hear about this, this is what I'm thinking. It says that they started to remove the roof above him. And who's him? It's Jesus. Jesus is in his house, and these four friends and the paralyzed man are on the roof because they can't get to Jesus. So they start tearing apart this roof. They start tearing apart so they could get to Jesus. So imagine they start doing that and stuff is falling through and might even be falling on everybody's heads and they're all looking up, what's going on here? There's light coming through and all of that. And all of a sudden it says, and when they had made the opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And right there in my Bible, it's written in red. So who said it? Jesus said it. Son, your sins are forgiven. So right there, I, I'm like, what the heck? There's a lot going on in this story. A lot, okay? They're tearing apart this roof and they're lowering this paralyzed man with ropes. And, and I mean, it's heavy and that, that would be hard and almost impossible and they're worried about dropping him and all that other stuff and they lower him down and Jesus notices him right off oh and he says you know what son your sins are forgiven he sees his faith his faith in Jesus but then interesting the story even keeps going it says some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts that means they're like hold on a second Jesus you can't do this in their head they're saying this why does this man speak like this? Meaning Jesus. He is blaspheming. In other words, he's making fun of God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, we're reading this, but we already know that we say that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Back then, the scribes, they didn't really understand that yet or really even believe it. And immediately Jesus, understanding in his spirit, that they are questioning themselves. So they're like struggling with this. He already knows what's going on. He asks them, and uh, in my Bible, it turns red. It says, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? So he asks them, there's two things you can think through here. Okay, what's easier? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? I mean, really? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he says, okay, so you know that I'm fully God and fully man. To teach you this, scribes and people around, he said to the paralyzed man at this point, get up. I say to you, the Bible says in verse 11, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. So he rose up immediately. I imagine he rose up and he jumped probably. He rolled his bed up. And he went out before all. So he walks outside. He looks around. I can imagine all this. And the Bible says they were all amazed and all and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Nothing like this. We've never seen anything like this. So in your notes, I need you to fill this in before we go any farther. Jesus healed a man and forgave his sins. 
Jesus healed a man and forgave his sins. Are you filling that, that in? Jesus healed a man and forgave his sins. We need to understand that in this story, that's what happened. Jesus did it. Jesus healed a man and forgave his sins. But it's really important for us to understand something. The man was not forgiven because of his friend's faith. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Is Jesus didn't forgive the man's sins, the paralyzed man's sins, because his friends had faith. That faith had to come from the paralyzed man. Okay, we don't know why Jesus doesn't say that all those, all, all of their friends were forgiven. He just says the one paralyzed man's friends forgiven. So I think about the story, if we rewind all the way at the beginning, where the paralyzed man is wherever he's at, at home or whatever, and his four friends are over and he says, hey guys, I got an idea. Why don't you take me to Jesus? I believe he can save me. He can heal me. I believe that. Or what if his four friends came to him and said, hey, paralyzed man, whatever his name is, hey, we want to take you to Jesus. We know somebody that can save you and explains all about Jesus. That's how I think the story actually goes. But think about what went on there. So they put him on his bed and they pick him up and they take him to Jesus and then they have to tear up the ceiling, roof, drop him down in there and the man understands. And his faith in Jesus, he says, you are forgiven for your sins. And then all of a sudden, he says, oh yeah, get up and, by the way, get up and walk. I am God. I can do that. I can, I can heal you. So I want you to think about that. What we do know is that you are not saved from your sins by other people believing. You're not saved from your sins because your parents are. You're not saved from your sins because your friends are. At some point, you have to understand that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved from your sins. And that's between you and Jesus. The other thing is, is, is that when you pray for others, friends, maybe they're sick or maybe they have sinned and you're praying for them. You should pray believing that God can heal them and believing that he can forgive them for their sins. And then you need to trust that God knows best that he will make the right decision, that God will. But we can, we can pray for him and say, Lord, please heal them. Lord, please help my friend that doesn't believe in you. Those are real prayers that need to happen. And then when we see our friends, we need to tell them, I've been praying for you. I love you. I care for you. And we need to take care of them. The four men who carried their friend to Jesus had faith. They trusted that Jesus could heal their friend who could not walk. I love that part of that story. Okay, I love that part of that story. This reminds me that a true friend is someone that points you to Jesus. So I'm thinking about this quarantine time, how we're at home and we're not we're not able to actually go hang out with our friends, but a lot of us are FaceTiming and talking to our friends, our grandparents, our family members, and all that. You know what? During this time, is so important for us to point our friends and family members to Jesus. We are responsible to do that. Do we trust that Jesus can save the sick, heal the sick, save the sinner? Okay. I know I know it's hard. I know it's hard sometimes. Maybe you think that they're going to make fun of you. But it's a hard things in life that matter. Okay? Imagine taking this paralyzed man up the stairs, wrapping ropes of him, around him, and dropping him down through the ceiling. Imagine that. That was hard. In life, it's the hard things that matter. So our point of today is Jesus healed a man and forgave his, forgave his sins. And God calls us to bring our friends to Jesus. He does. And he has the power. We believe, I believe, you believe that he has a power to heal us and forgive our sins. But the question is, are you willing to tell somebody? 
Are you willing to help somebody? Because it might get hard. So I want everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads. Close their eyes and bow their heads, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray right now. So I need you to put your pencils down. I need you to stop filling out the activities. I know they're fun, but we're going to pray real quick. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we th- we're thank you for sending Jesus to take the punishment for our sins so that we can be forgiven. I pray that we would all look to Jesus to rescue us from our sins. And Lord, help us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I hope you're having a great day. I hope you're having a great Sunday. I look forward to the next time I get to see you.